What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 629. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are the holidays treating you? Oh, they're great. You know, I've got some family in town, uh, just kind of getting getting a lot of good holiday action in. We've been, uh, you know, a different person has been cooking dinner every night, so it's been cool seeing kind of the range. My uh, my little brother cooked fresh pesto with shrimp and clams and pasta yesterday, and that Dang. was like – So I'm, I'm 11 years older than, than my youngest brother, and uh, it – he's still always going to be like a little kid to me. And it's just like, he cooked like a very grown up meal, you know? So <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I haven't seen him in a few years. So that probably, even then the difference is probably quite a bit, but uh, make sure you say hi to the tyrant for me as I haven't seen him in a while. Um, right. So we've got uh, the Limmies this, this, uh, this time, this is our <laughs> end of the year awards. The Limmies are here, Luis. This is one of your additions to the show. And you always get excited when we get to do our, our end of the year awards. Yeah, the Limmies are great. Uh, <laughs> it's a long tradition of sign offs turning into shows. Uh, yeah. I think the first time that happened was when I was like, all right, look, here, here's the here's the four biggest traps. And you're like, whoa, 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 let's save that one for the show, buddy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's what this ended up being as well. So we're going to be giving away our end of the year awards on the Limmy show this time. Uh, before we get into it, let's mention our sponsors. First, channelfireball.com is a place to go for all things magic related on ye old internet. You know, if you need sync- Singles, it's a no-brainer, right? They have the marketplace now over at Channel Fireball, and that means that you get to choose from a multitude of different retailers. That's right, different people that sell singles, and you can pick, you know, the grade that you want, the the price, you can price shop between them and all that, but you still get that Channel Fireball experience, uh, customer service wise and all that. So it's really kind of the best of both worlds. But also, of course, while you're on Channel Fireball, you can pick up sealed product and you can even get stuff for other games like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Flesh and Blood if you're into those. And uh, you can you know, maybe spend some of the holiday money that you got if you if you ended up getting any of that or last minute presents, that type of stuff over at Channel Fireball. If you do pick up anything, if you use the affiliate code LR. I do appreciate it. The show is also brought to you by FTX. That's right. FTX is the place to go for all of your digital asset needs. And that might sound weird to you. You might be going, what do I, what do I need digital assets for? Well, that's kind of the world where we're heading into. Um, things like cryptocurrency NFTs, uh, have a lot of potential. And uh, we're just stepping into that world now to see kind of where these things go. You know, some people call it web 3.0 or things like that. It's a, it's a different way to uh, make different types of transactions. And I think we're still very much discovering what it is uh, that we're going to be using these for on a daily basis. If you want to get in on it, you can head over to FTX.us for US-based customers or FTX.com for customers outside the United States. And uh, they they have an app for your phone or uh, and or the website, and they let you uh, buy, sell, and manage your digital assets. I will remind you uh, that if you do decide to do investment of any kind on FTX, make sure that you consult a uh, investment professional before doing so, as with any type of investment, there is risk. Um, last but not least, the Patreon. Patreon.com slash limited resources is where you can support the show directly, and we want to thank each and every person over on the Patreon for supporting us. It really does mean the world to us. One of the, oh, uh, before we get into uh, our question of the week, Luis, uh, we've got a, uh, a charity draft brewing here with FTX. Yeah. So we're, 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 we're still figuring out the exact date. It's going to be in the next week and a half, two weeks, something like that is what it's looking like. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a awesome event. So basically we're going to do a vintage cube draft, uh, Myself, you, BK, and Kenji Newmont, plus uh, four folks from FTX. Uh, I, I heard including SBF, their 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 owner. We'll see if that if that pans out. Uh, and um, the winner of the draft, the person who goes three zero, is going to get ten thousand dollars to the charity of their choice. If you go two one, it's five thousand dollars. And if you get zero or one wins, which is to say you get any other place at all, it's twenty five hundred to the charity of your choice. So it's a uh, thirty five k going to charity and uh, some some cool vintage cube action. And I know that. Both of us are going to be uh, streaming is what it looks like. It look like, looks like it's going to line up for that to happen. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Uh, do you know who you're going to play for? Which uh, 
which charitable organization or, or yeah, whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to play for Planned Parenthood. I really like the cause. I think they really help people's lives. So, uh, that, that's what I'm going to go ahead and choose as my charity. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to be playing for uh, Seattle children's hospital, which is, uh, you know, uh, something that I've helped fundraise for around here before. And it's really, really, uh, really cool to help out kids, especially this time of year. Okay. Let's get to our Patreon question of the week from Nils Lunza, who says, Hey guys, one of my favorite draft archetypes I remember was Infect in Scars of Mirrodin. I really like the all in or nothing aspect of the deck where you had to put all your eggs in one basket or otherwise your deck would fail. We just recently had something similar with Snow in Kaldheim. My question is, what are your thoughts on those kind of decks? Do you enjoy the risk that comes with them or are they bad for particular formats? Love your content and greetings from Germany. Say viele Grüße. That's what you're supposed to say, Luis. Viele Grüße. Very good. Nice job. What do you think about those? You know, it is interesting because this is something that, that R&D will pull out every once in a while. Right. We don't see this that often where there's kind of a really narrow, the card just sort of has to say <laughs> infect on it or have snow applications or else, you know, it, the deck really doesn't work as Niels uh, pointed out, but they do still pull this out. It's not like it's gone. W what do you think about it from like a design perspective? So what we're talking about are extremely linear decks, usually with a parasitic mechanic. And wh what those basically mean is, very focused decks. And in the case of Infect, it only cares about Infect and Parasitic in that it doesn't care about things that aren't that, like, it, 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 you, it's, it all works within its own little bubble. Like, when you look at, uh, you know, most formats these days, you take the blue, like, you've got a blue-black deck or a blue-red deck. And there's some overlap where the blue spells can go well in the blue-black deck because they make zombies, but any kind of spells go well in blue-red because it's a blue-red spells deck. Mm -hmm. Infect's not like that. You don't want infect creatures in your non-infect deck, and you don't want non-infect creatures uh, – or rather, you only want infect creatures in your infect deck. You don't want them outside of right. it, and you don't want non-infect creatures in your infect deck because otherwise you're just dealing damage. It's like it's like hitting them for damage and milling them. You don't want to do both at the same time. Right. You, want you don't want to split it down the middle. Right. That's a disaster. Yeah. So I think that uh, when done properly, these kinds of decks can be really cool. Like I think it is a huge upside to have this because the reason I think the, the best thing about something like Infect or Mill when that's a deck or any of these other like kind of like linear weird strategies is that it provides a different experience than you normally have. And that can mm -hmm. be really valuable because getting to to have different experiences than normal is what kind of keeps you coming back to a particular format. Now where it goes wrong is if like cycling in a choreo was too good. And I think that cycling, especially with the cycling cards being colorless, also cycling in particular was an extremely repetitive experience. Yes. When when you played against the cycling deck, they would go cycle, 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 play a snare tactician or whatever, cycle, 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 zenith flare you. Yep. That was it. It was basically the same game over and over again. When you play against like Infect, it can be a very different game every time because some have, you know, in those formats had prol proliferate, some had pump spells, some had evasion, some just had more removal and they were like control Infect, wh whatever it ends up being. So I think that when done well, it can be an awesome part of the experience uh, and there's ways to do it poorly as well. Yeah. What do you think about the um, the tension that it adds to the draft portion? Right. Where you're kind of forced at some point to, to move in on it. But if you do get cut off, you know, there's a good chance that your deck is, is significantly worse than a, than a normal, like, Oh, I got cut off of my colors or, or something like that style deck. Right. I mean, where you might be forced to play a real stinker, you know, if, if you decide to go in on infect or snow and somebody cuts you. So, the draft, it, it's, it kind of cuts both ways, actually, where it can be really exciting when you get there. When you pick up yeah. your seventh infect creature, you know, you're just like, wow, this is amazing. Or like you're playing Mill and you get and you wheel the, the mind sculpt that, you know, mills them for six and you're just like, this is incredible. I get to use these cards no one else cares about. Uh, you know, I'm drafting this really – this deck that attacks from a different angle than most. Really exciting. The downside, though, is that like you just don't look at cards that aren't in that strategy for the most part, and that 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 can be a little boring. It's like, oh, I yeah. opened a pack and there's no infect cards in the pack. Okay, and I guess I would take a removal spell. No, none of those either. Well, this pack's kind of blank for me. Like the Acoria decks with cycling again, this one was where it kind of went wrong. 
if you didn't have a card that either had cycling or said the word cycling on it, you were pretty unhappy with uh, with how that pack went, which means there was actually kind of a lot of packs where you're just like, well, no, nah, nothing here. Yeah, totally. I the, the interesting thing to me is is finding that balance. The, I think the point that you brought up is really the critical one. So let's just say that there's one of these type of archetypes in a format. And so somebody decides, okay, I'm going to go for it. And they got there, right? Like they had a, they have a good B plus version of whatever this deck is. Then it gets really interesting because you mentioned the, the fact that it, it, it plays a lot differently. The games play differently. It's different dynamic. That's a big benefit. That's huge for the format to have, you know, a curveball thrown where it's like, Oh wow, I have to adjust to this and this is totally different. But power level is also really important. And this is where the Aquaria cycling deck missed on both, right? It didn't actually play. I mean, it did play differently relative to the other decks, but the deck itself played the same every single time. And then it was way too powerful. The, the cards were just pushed too much. <clears throat> but let's use Infect as the example. Should it be better than the average deck if I, if I make it? Or should it be better than the good decks if I make it? is maybe a better way to put it. It kind of depends. It's you want there to be a reward for going all in on something. Yeah. Right? Otherwise like it, and, and this is a uh, kind of how you see it play out when there's like a bad archetype, like exploit actually is kind of a, is kind of that in, uh, in bow where it's like, if you move all in on exploit and you get there, you end up with an average deck. Yeah. And when you miss, you end up with a below average deck. And that's not a very good uh, kind of risk reward. Whereas right. I think that in Ikoria was too easy, especially in the beginning when other people didn't know what was going on. Because, you know, in the first week of Ikoria, I, I forced, you know, I, was, I, I like when I find something like this, I just run with it, right? Just to see how far it can go. Hey, until they stop you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it happened in uh, in in Midnight Hunt, right? Where I just drafted blue black twenty times in a row. Right. Where I was literally, you know, uh, Ben has stopped by the stream once, and made fun of me because I took uh, some black common over uh, the the Corsair of Crufix, Augur of Autumn. I remember that. It, yeah. Or, no, I took Organ Hoarder, which actually, in retrospect, that wasn't even forcing. Organ Hoarder is busted, but at the time, it was like, oh, you're just forcing blue black, and it's like, yeah, no one's making it bad to do this. It always works, and. In Aquaria, I was first picking memory leaks over, you know, good like white removal spells or whatever, red removal spells, because it's like, yeah, I can just get into the cycling deck and it's going to be busted. That's not good. But having it be such that, okay, if I open a, a good infect card, I can first pick it and then try to move in versus, you know, and versus like you get to the you don't want to get to the point where a bad infect common is better than a good rare in a different color. Cause that's like a signal that the deck's too pushed. But when it's a viable path, I mean, Martin Juza, he won Grand Prix Bochum by moving all in on infect when he had opened like hand of the prayers and got past an infect creature. And, you know, at one point, like he said, going into pack three, when I talked to him later, he would have taken plague sting over worm coil engine. Mm. You know, he would have taken one, one flying infect over worm coil engine, which is obviously a limited bomb overall. Cause his deck was that focused. And I think that's actually cool when that happens. I don't love it as much when pick one, pack one, you would do that. Because right. then that that that's a little bit absurd. But you know what? There's something to to breaking limited formats, and uh, it could be really fun when you know something other people don't. Yeah, I think if, if, if anything, I'd like to see them turn this up just a little. Like, I wouldn't want to see this every single set where there's some crazy deck to go for, but I like, I like seeing it every few sets for sure. All right, let's crack a pack. Good of, question. Uh, yeah, that was a great question. Thanks, Nils, for that. And let's get into uh, our crack -a pack here. So our first card out is Sure Strike. We're surely not going to take a Dreadlight Monstrosity. No. Parish Blade Trainee. Man, I really don't like this card. <clears throat> you, you said uh, when we were drafting, eh, if you need a two drop, you can play it. Is that where you're at on the Trainee? Yeah, but I'm mostly not looking for it. Like, okay. I, I, I think that <clears throat> training is not inherently a bad mechanic. They just didn't push the trading cards enough, in my opinion, and as a result, it kind of sucks. Yeah, we'll talk about it on the, the Vow Sunset show, but uh, training definitely missed. And I, I think that there's a fundamental issue to mechanics like training, and we'll talk about that <clears throat> um, in the in the Sunset. Uh, Lightning Wolf. This card's well, been very bad. Cool art, but yeah, not, not something I'm looking to yeah, take. Big fluffy pup. Um, persistent Specimen. I have not been a fan of Persistent Specimen. People do play it against me still um, on the ladder. You'll see it around. But when they do, 
you know, it's, it's either a, kind of a critical piece of, of some exploit specific deck or it, or it just kind of tends to underperform in my experience. The only time it's really busted is with Dreadfeast Demon, which you may think doesn't need the help, and mostly you're correct. But I've seen Dreadfeast Demon offs where both pe- people have them, and Persistent <laughs> Specimen breaks that right in half because you can insane. keep bringing it back yeah. in response to Demon Triggers. That's great. Three mana, 6-6 six, six flyer. <laughs> That's pretty good. You know, one of the other things that pops up um, with this is they uh, pushed – the exile stuff just a little bit, right? Like there's two different commons that could exile this so that if it was an issue, it would, it would just go away in, in flame bless bolt. And, uh, what's it called? The two BB one, uh, massive might. I like a massive might, but I'm not picking it here. This pack sucks so far. Here we go. Traveling minister, our guy. There we go. I mean, that's the best so far. Yeah, that's the good one. Um, honored heirloom. No weary prisoner. no, that gives us to the uncommons. This is actually one of my favorite uncommons in the set, but I'm not, I don't think I'm going to take it over the minister. It's a Markov purifier. That's the one black, white, two, three life linker. And at the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, you can pay two and draw a card. Uh, it's fine. Like yeah. I, that, that card's routinely disappointed me because for it to work, it either needs to get a clear attack in, which it usually doesn't. Mm. You need to have another source of life gain, and you want to spend two mana to draw a card, which isn't always something you're in a position to do. So yes. it's a good card. I've never cut it from a black-white deck. The rate is high enough. You should always play it. But I would certainly take Traveling Minister over it, pick yes, one, pack one. Definitely. And I, I, I agree with that. I, I like the Purifier in the very defensive black-white deck, like the one that can play a lot of the, uh, what is it, Fierce Retributions or whatever, where it's like, hey, come at me. You know, and I'm just going to use my removal spells to pick off your guys. Dawn Heart Geist is next. That's the one in a white one, three, that whenever you cast an enchantment, you gain two life. What in the world is this card even doing? Like, why does it exist? Yeah. They're just, I well, mean, it's supposed to it, be a I, disturb thing. I think it was supposed to be something that was a kind of a bridge between black, white, and uh, blue, white, where in the blue, white deck, you could use it to gain four to six life and win the race. In the black, white deck, of course, you could gain life to trigger their stuff. The reality is you just don't put the card in your deck. Right. It just that for whatever reason that didn't happen. Uh mischievous cat geist is next. That's the one in a white one one that when it hits them, you draw a card and it has disturb for two minute blue that gives the creature the ability. Whenever it hits them, you draw a card. This card is overperformed, but I still haven't found it to be good. Yeah, that's how I, I I thought it was gonna be very bad, and it's been pretty bad. Uh, I still like traveling minister here. Uh, we actually have a foil uh, before we get to our rare, and it's Adamant Will. No. So can this rare knock off Traveling Minister as our pack one pick one for the crack a pack? And the answer is nope. Deathcap Glade. This is the black green dual rare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not a chance. <laughs> so our old friend, the Traveling Minister, takes it once again. Nice work. Okay. Let's get into our lemmies here, Luis. Um I guess we'll start off with a negative. <laughs> we're just come out punching for some reason. We should probably reorder these, but first, first Lemmy is for worst grade of the year. <laughs> you know what? I'll take my lumps. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that calling a uh, Selhoff occultist or whatever, Selhoff looter, the, you don't even know the name. It's so bad. The one three <laughs> looter just didn't, didn't get there. Look, in my defense, I, I really believe the exploit disturb deck was going to be good, but mm. it was not. And uh, that did impact this card, which was already on the weak side. I, I will admit that. But as a result, yeah, I'm, I'm not into I'm not into how this turned out. And I think it's not not a card you want to generally put in your deck, though. It can serve a purpose in some decks. It can. Yeah. Uh, wh- what about the our best grade of the year? I, I think this is actually symbolic of a, a lot of uh, what's happened in Limited and how we've approached it and, and how we've changed how it approached it is Traveling Minister, <laughs> the card that we just picked out of this crack pack. Because we saw it, right? We're like, wait a second. This card just seems really good. Like these type of cards tend to overperform. But, you know, in times past, this would be the type of card that would be overlooked uh, by us for sure. And I think by most people. And then all of a sudden, uh, hey, this card's actually pretty good. And, you know, you start you start picking up on the fact that it's good. But what's happened, uh, you know, limited design-wise over the past, you know, it's been a few years now is there's pretty clearly been an emphasis put on making one mana creatures playable in limited where that did not exist before. Uh, they would be 
you know, appropriate power level for one mana, which meant that their impact on the game was low enough that it was actually incorrect to play them, even if, you know, you were getting what you would consider comparable value for the mana. The mana was just too low to make it work. And they've done such a good job of finding, you know, there's a lot of text on these one drops now, right? Like they've had to kind of, you know, it's not one, one with flying anymore. Like they, they, they have to say a lot of words, but when they do, they've actually found a really nice little niche to, to be able to print one drops that are good. And now, you know, you and I, when we see one drops, we're like, Ooh, what do we got here? Because they keep pushing them and, and they end up uh, overperforming most of the time. Yeah, I think limited formats are greatly improved by having yeah. powerful one drops. And uh, I, I like the direction that they've been going here. Yeah, I mean, the thing to note here, too, is that these cards saw no play whatsoever in any format before. Like, they probably looked at them and said, okay, we've got this slot for this one drop. And it's not good enough for limited. And it doesn't fit into any constructed deck ever. Nobody's playing. Like, why are we wasting these slots, you know, in our in our on our sheet? And now you see cards like Traveling Minister and the Epicure and stuff all the time. Even the Wolf, you know, that got back to back printed. It sees play in both sets. Really nice stuff. So, and we were we were on top of that as well uh, this time. <laughs> this is one of the best Limmies. The Limmy for the hungriest co-host. <laughs> Well, I'd like to proudly accept my 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 Limmy once again because, uh, <laughs> as it turns out, uh, that's still me, you know. And uh, you know, honorable mention of Marshall, though for sure. I've got a real streak of honorable mentions going with this with this particular Limmy. Man, we we really need to reorder these. This is just such a downer to start it off. But <laughs> their Limmies, their next Limmies for most embarrassing draft pick. And the funny part is, is that we used to have to kind of remember ourselves you know what we did but now we've got the lr versus lol showdowns to uh to showcase our our bad picks yeah and this is once again me furio's retribution uh against uh t you know t team uh lords uh, right slotted right into ethan's awesome black white deck and uh <laughs> we we suffered one of our two crushing defeats at the hands of the Lords. Yes, that was when they, when Ethan, I was like, come on, Luis, like, what the hell? And, but you had some idea, right? Like, there is a reason you did that. It was greedy. I, 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 I thought he wasn't black, white, it, it, but as okay. it turns out, it was just a, not a good risk to take. I do, I did take a good card. I don't remember what I took over it, but yeah, yeah it got pretty worked. I was also in a tough spot because my deck was really bad at that point. Mm. So you I felt playables. like it was. It was going to be tough for me to end up uh, not taking a good card out of that pack, but I, I do, I do. I'm not defending the draft pick. It was a bad pick. Yeah, but it is interesting because you know, in that particular case, it didn't work out. <clears throat> but you know, when you do break down team draft, it does get really interesting because you know, let's say that there's a world where where you were right, and um, you know, what was was Furious Retribution like one white, white, black or one black, black, white? I can't remember. I think it was white, white, black. Yeah. So let's just say that um, whoever you're passing to was Ethan d didn't wasn't in black at all or wasn't in white at all. Excuse me. So just really couldn't play this card at that point or, you know, it would be like a major upheaval of his deck to to be able to do that. Um, You know, you put that player in a really awkward spot, right? Because they either feel the need to take it and cut it from the opponents, in which case they've just ripped up their second pick of the draft or, you know, uh, of that pack or, you know, they, they pass it. And if they do that, and then there's a chance that BK or me gets that card and can actually play it. Like if we're touching, if we're in white at all, then all of a sudden it's a huge win. So there is a lot of upside there, but it's just uh, also very risky. Um, most improved format. This one I think is pretty easy for for me. It was it was Vow. It was Crimson Vow, because I mean early in the format there was a lot of worry from both of us and a lot of people in the community about the uh, bombiness of the format. And I kind of thought, oh no, you know my 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 first few drafts I was like this might not be very good, and I was worried that we had a bit of a stinker on our hands here. But it actually really came around for me uh, primarily because of the balanced colors and the gameplay. Yeah, I, I agree that Vow, my first five drafts were all right. My next five drafts, I started to think like, man, this, I, I'm not sure I like this format. And I kind of pushed through that. And I ended up thinking that the, the format 
was good overall. Like, I did enjoy the format. It's not the best format. Like I said, we went from a four out of 10 to six out of 10, but six out of 10 is above the bar. Yeah. Right? It's it, maybe, you know, maybe that, maybe that bar needs to be reworked. Cause in, if you look at the past, let's just year of formats, right? We had, uh, Cold basically a, oh, I was mm-hmm. going to say AFR was, was a miss and Val was probably the second worst after AFR. I still think AFR actually ended up being worse than Val overall. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, I liked Strixhaven. I liked Kaldheim. I liked, uh, you know, Midnight Hunt. Like the, these are all good formats. Like they, they generally don't miss at this point. So, yeah. uh, I think that I would still have Val on the lower end of the scale, especially if you compare it to the last two years of formats. But it definitely went it, it went up fifty percent, right? In, yes. in terms of a grade, yeah, like that's so, pretty big. So, like, where I wonder where we should have the bar because for me, the, there's a I don't know if the if this is the fifty you know five out of ten bar, but there's a real big difference for me between a set that I'm willing to draft basically until the next set comes out or until the vintage cube comes out. Um, and a set that I kind of go, mm, think I'm done here, right? I'm kind of like the, the, whatever comes out next, I'm just hopping on that train and not really feeling the need to go back. The only set that that happened for me for this, this year was AFR and Val has cleared that bar for me. Like I drafted it last night. Like I, you know, I, I still enjoy it. I feel like I sit down and I can draft any color pair and put together something that I can win with. And I love that. I mean, to me, this has sort of renewed my, uh, how much weight I put on balance. You know, you've said it before, balance doesn't equal fun, but balance is a huge component to replayability for me. It's just, if I can draft, you know, any of the colors and not feel like I'm just throw, you know, just tossing equity, then I feel like I can make stuff. For, I mean, I've been drafting a lot of blue red now. Like that's kind of become my go-to deck. I've drafted red white a lot lately, which is like a color pair. I didn't touch much earlier in the format. And I still feel like, you know, there's room to explore. So it's, it's cleared whatever that bar is. I don't know. That's probably the bar for it being like a good set rather than just like above average. But, uh, but yeah, for me, a most improved format for us uh, was, was valve for sure. Um, what about most valuable contributor guests? Oh, this is a slam dunk. We both had the same answer here without any debate. It's got to be Sirkovitz. Oh yeah. Sirky brought the heat, you know, his, his, his presence on the show, you know, we, we had him come on after basically every, uh, set, you know, once per set cycle, we did miss one in there, but, um, but for, for you know, his ability to answer our questions using data and, you know, it's, one of the huge bridges that we need to cross right now, we've been talking about this and we'll keep talking about it going forward too, is, is this influx of data thanks to 17 lands and similar sites. And this is dangerous data, <laughs> right? This is like, you got to be careful. You can really go off the rails with this type of stuff or over, try to oversimplify drafting, which doesn't work. But at the same time, it's really powerful. And the in-between that you need is somebody like Sirkovitz who can understand how to take that data and present stuff that's actually actionable or useful rather than just um, raw numbers, which is, you know, what m- most of us look at. Anything else on Sirkovitz? No, no. I think he's a, he's a fun dude to talk to. I think that's a big part of it too. Yeah, th- that's what I was going to say too is just that he's – like his personality and his ability, you can tell that he's like a teacher, right? Like kind of a natural teacher. He, he's very, very good at explaining things. And, you know, he's always asking, Hey, you know, ask me questions, you know, like come up with more stuff for me to look up. Like he's, he's really great at that. So thanks Sergovitz for your contribution this year. And we look forward to uh, having you on shows uh, in the future as well. <laughs> All right, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> most valuable contributor sign offs who <laughs> we we've had uh shahar shenhar i think ben stark won one time who do we got this year for the most valuable contributors <laughs> sign offs category uh i'm actually you know gonna go ahead and give the award to wizards of the coast no they led to a lot of a lot of interesting <laughs> sign offs this year <laughs> a lot a lot of a lot of fluctuation when it comes to magic and uh yeah, you know what? Most interesting sign-offs is definitely an award, and uh, in this case, they won it. They they, they are most did. valuable contributor to sign-offs, so they they definitely 
Yeah, that was that was kind of where we're at, and you know, it's an award. I hope they don't win next year, but we'll see. We'll see what ends up go- what happening. Hey, you know, there's a world where they win it next year, and you're happy, right? That could happen. Yeah, that is true. I mean, right? you, anything could happen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let's uh, let's just uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, most valuable resource. Who, who's our, who's the most valuable resource this year? So I think what the, the only metric that I think it really makes sense to use is, is record in the showdowns because this is where <laughs> okay. the resources are pitted against the lords in a battle for podcast victory. So, well, it's got to be BK. He's got the best record in the in the showdowns. Uh, he's killing and he, it. He, he goes in pretty close to cold. Yeah, he's like, unbelievable. Like he – that's the most impressive thing is that – He's the least prepared of all of us and somehow is, is doing, and he always comes up with these wacky, crazy decks, but then plays them really well and, and picks up a bunch of wins. So we all jump on BK shoulders. I think more accurately, I jump on you and BK shoulders <laughs> would be probably the most accurate. But anyway, thanks BK for carrying us. You, you win the most valuable resource, Lemmy, for this year. Oh, here's a new one. Most valuable producer. Unfortunately, I think we couldn't find a winner for this year. It was a, it was a, it was a tough <laughs> field, but nobody now. Of course, Jeff, Jeff wins here, and uh, Jeff has definitely leveled up the show. We've been glad to have him this year, and really look forward to having him on the show going forward. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for for putting up with us uh, for for pushing a year here. Uh, Jeff is our is our video producer. If you watch the video on YouTube or the live stream, he's the one who sets all that up for us. And also he's a part of the show in the sense of we bounce ideas off of Jeff. He, he, he'll throw stuff at us. Um, you know, he's just kind of a, another, another pair of ears in the room for Luis and I to go, should we talk about this or what does this sound like? Or how about that? And he's always there to, to back us up. So Jeff, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us and enjoy your first Lemmy most valuable producer. For Jeff, um, most valuable episode, <laughs> easy slam dunk here, right? <laughs> Keto is the new bread game changer, baby. <laughs> that's it game. I mean, it's all about, it's all about branding. That's the, the that's the, that's the whole deal. So, okay. Uh, I have a question then. Do you remember what keto stands for? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, killer removal, <laughs> <laughs> efficient threats, <laughs> Uh, or efficiency threats and other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume that that's right, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it is served bread. I will say the holidays aren't really a time to for keto in general. So that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but strange that they are because everybody's drafting, right? This is when the vintage. Although you know, keto in the vintage cube is not really where you want to be anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Vintage Cube is kind of its own thing. Yeah, so you're right. So this is the time to to set keto aside and uh, fire up the Holiday Cube, which, by the way, went up yesterday or maybe the oh, day before. Oh, I'm but, well aware. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I've already got a draft in on there as well. I went back to my roots. I drafted blue-green. Soon I'll start drafting nonsense, though. Um, okay, this one's always tough. Uh, I feel like we should crowdsource this one in the future, but we got a few good stabs here. Best card name let me for the best card name some of the uh ones that we have here are velomachus lorehold i mean you you had to consider naming santi velomachus lorehold scott vargas montero right? well v- v- velomachus lorehold is is just an absurdly good name it's just great right and then another one a little on the different end of the spectrum here is flump <laughs> flump is funny you know like maybe I, it's I, not I, as I, funny for you because you're used to it but for me like flump is really funny yeah, I, I I like the uh the the, the short and to the point card names. Those are pretty cool. Yeah, so there's one. Um what else we got? We got Frog Hemoth. That's pretty good. I like this name a lot too. Brunor Battlehammer. Like that's you know what's going on with Brunor Battlehammer. Old stick fingers. <laughs> Old stick fingers. <laughs> uh, and then we've got Slow Gurk the Over Slime, which is which is another, which is another pretty insane name. Yeah, um, th- these are all pretty good. I still think Velomachus Lorehold is the best of these, though. Okay, all right, Velomachus Lorehold, you win the Lemmy for best card name. Um, sweetest build around. They they went pretty deep on a few of these. A couple that came to mind was uh, Cody. 
Cody was a kind of a cool build around. And, Cody was pretty fun, yeah. Yeah, and actually worked too. One that I never got to work. I think did you? I maybe I don't know, but I, it's I think it's my winner is Harness Infinity. If you remember that card, yeah, the you draw your whole graveyard card. Yeah, you you draw your whole graveyard, and that was a really difficult one to actually build around. Um, but it, I mean, you know, completely insane if it if you could actually make it work. That was in um, Strixhaven, and it cost one black, 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 green, 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 and you exchange your uh, exchange your hand in your graveyard, and then you exile Harness Infinity. Did you ever get it to work? Yeah, I had one deck where it was pretty good. It was like a black green. It was I was playing sealed mm. and I played Harness Infinity and I had about six removal spells and mm. some decent creatures and it actually ended up working out pretty well. Like it was it felt like a bomb in sealed, which it never really did whenever I drafted it. It just didn't really work out, but in sealed it was good. Yeah, Another I think it was just around, bad, but yes. Yeah. Another build around um that I really enjoyed was mascot exhibition. I thought that was a pretty fun build around. <laughs> so <laughs> you got any experience in sealed with max mascot exhibitions. Well, the, that arena open in Strixhaven where I got literally the best sealed deck I ever had with two mascot exhibitions and like <laughs> 10 learn cards. It was just in a including bunch of other the ramp. Too. I had like three other rares too. <laughs> yeah, that was absolutely. I, really, I remember people were just scooping to you. Like when you would put, one, well, either the first or the second one in hand. Well, what I, something that I that I did a few times was I would uh, play uh, turn three, you know, ramp. like a, a field trip, go yep. get you know ramp and go get a mascot exhibition. Turn four, play another field trip, get another mascot exhibition. And they just scooped at that <laughs> point. Just end the game. I, I really regret that I didn't record any of those games. That that is a tragedy. Yes. So would you? Would you like to give mascot exhibition best build around or sweetest? Yeah, sorry, 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 sweetest build around, not to be confused with best. Yeah, I think mascot exhibition does fit there. It maybe maybe the sweetness it's less on the sweetness scale and more on the bustedness scale. To be uh, to be fair, yeah. So maybe we give it to uh, uh, to having two mascot exhibitions. That's the sweetest of all build arounds. Um. Most disappointing build around. The the one that jumped out to me, um, it's not a specific card necessarily, though I'm sure there's some examples, but it was dungeons, like the dungeon mechanic in AFR. Uh, you know, you could build around that mechanic all you wanted. It just didn't keep up with the other mechanics on a power level perspective. It just wasn't that good. Yeah, I think dungeon was a pretty big mistake. It... It was really complex, had very minor payoffs, and wasn't that exciting all told. And especially given the complexity, that's just not worth it. Right. Really, really I think really, really poor execution on what could have been a pretty cool mechanic. It wasn't going to be a hard mechanic to get right. I don't envy the balance testing and the you know design that went into it in terms of like how difficult it was. I think it, it is very difficult. It's an ambitious mechanic for sure, but. You know, sometimes ambitious mechanics still don't work out. And I think Dungeon gets about a D from me. Yeah. You know, what it felt like to me, um, looking back on it, and, and, and on the Sunset Show, we mentioned this too, but it felt like they recognized that this was shaky territory as far as power level goes. Meaning, if you overdo this, it's too easy, right? Like, if you're just cruising through a dungeon and it just gives you this huge edge – as you work your way through the game, they tacked, you know, venture into the dungeon onto too many cards to make that too powerful. So it felt to me like they said, okay, we're going to have to be conservative here and turn down the power level on this because if we get this wrong and it's too powerful, it's really a huge mistake. And if we get this wrong and it's a little under the power level bar, then we still get to lean on the fact that it's kind of this cool thing that we haven't done before. It's kind of a neat mechanic. It it has this visual thing and these words and the way that you go through the dungeon and it just sort of adds a lot. Um, you know, it, it's a big addition mechanically to the set and that they probably just said, let's just lean on that and not push our luck. I think the really difficult thing that they chose to do with it was the the fact that you could choose from three different dungeons and trying to find a way to make that work 
is really difficult because you need the dungeons to be significantly different from each other. And two of the dungeons were too similar where the third one was quite a bit different. Basically there was like an aggro dungeon and then, you know, there was kind of a mid range dungeon and a control dungeon, but it turns out the mid range dungeon just sort of outperformed the control dungeon, um, every time. So you were heavily incentivized to just go for the middle in most situations outside of ones where you were like really trying to beat down, which, which just didn't come up that often. And it ended up being that we went into the same dungeon, like, I don't know, 80 something percent of the time. And that's just like, that's a really big bite to chew off there. If you're like, well, we're going to make three different dungeons and we're going to have people, you know, I think in an ideal world, they would have it roughly equal and it wasn't even remotely close. So that was really Yeah, my guess is it's even higher than 80%. Yeah, and that's really rough. The other one that came around for most disappointing build around were cards like Lorehold Excavation or Quintorius Field Historian, just the Lorehold um, School or College or whatever it was called. You know, that one had all this really cool stuff about like caring about cards being exiled from your graveyard and turning them into three, two spirits and all this neat stuff that was supposed to be around it. And when you read the cards individually, they actually seemed like, okay, there's something here. You know, Lorehold Excavation looked really cool. Quintorius just looked straight up strong to me, all under the assumption that that mechanic was properly supported and it just really wasn't. And uh, as a result, uh, Lorehold really suffered as a, as a college, but more specifically that the build around nature of it with the excavating or whatever it was that, that they were going for, uh, flopped pretty hard for me too. Yeah. Lorehold. I mean, Lorehold and to some extent, Witherbloom did lead to Strixhaven have feeling like a three deck format where, yeah. you, you know, you, you were the, the two teamer guilds and then uh silver quill, but the, the format ended up being all right, but that is one of the risks of the five pair formats, the guild style formats, is yeah. when you miss, which they did with Lorehold and kind of missed with Witherbloom, less so, but when you miss, it just really impacts how, how well the format plays out. And I think Strixhaven, the gameplay was good enough with all the rest that it was still a good format, but really could have gone gone badly if it, if, if it was just a little bit worse there. Yeah. Um, let's give it to Dungeons, though, because that was a headliner yes, mechanic sure. and yeah. So most disappointing build around Lemmy dungeons. Um, what about the sweetest archetype? What was what were some of the really cool things you could do uh, this year? I mean, I think the best performing archetype was blue black zombies out of uh, Midnight Hunt. That certainly was my best performing archetype. Even after the initial wave where people started to draft it, when it was open, it was still very very good. Mm-hmm. I think my favorite one was like the five color snow decks from Caldheim. I had a oh, four Svelas yeah. in a draft once, and that was a lot of fun. Remember just, when you did you discard like multiple Svelas or something? There was like a real moment there. They, what was they it? They made me discard two, and I discarded two Svelas with Svela in play. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's just completely disgusting, but really funny. Uh, your opponent must have just been like, are you serious right now? That was one of my favorite cards of the year, too, Svela. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that. I, I think Blue Black Zombie is probably the best performer, but it, it, this is for sweetest archetype, not necessarily best performing. So I, I like that one. I like that the multicolored deck from uh, from Kaldheim. And then for me personally, I it, this wasn't an archetype, but I did do this once, <laughs> which is I – got goaded by my chat into playing the plow, the plow ox deck and basically forcing it. And, you know, they, they, I, you know, they were calling me a coward and I'm like, this is not a coward stream. And so I'm, I'm taking, you know, I'm just first picking these cards and just forcing it. And the deck was actually coming together. Like I was kind of doing it. I, I got some of the ox and the plows and I'm like, wow. Okay. And I, I think it started by first picking a, a plow or something like that. And then, you know, which gives you like what three mana and life and, you know, three white mana and some life and stuff. But then we opened up Coma, which is probably the best card in that format, but it costs double blue, double green. And so then my chat called me a coward again if I didn't take it. So I said, well, screw that. And I took it and I played Coma in my plow deck and uh, and we actually won with it. So (laughs) that was probably the one of the highlights of my draft career <laughs> right there so that's definitely my sweetest individual archetype though again calling that an archetype is a bit of a stretch it was more just a deck oh this next one's sad Luis. the lemmy for the worst archetype 
of the year. And look, there were probably lower performing archetypes, but from a set perspective, red green werewolves in midnight hunt, the set that was kind of named after what werewolves are supposed to be doing, which is hunting at midnight. It was the worst that poor, the poor werewolves flopped so hard and they're going to take home the Lemmy here. What's your takeaways from that, Luis? I mean, how is, how is it that midnight hunt ended up uh, with red green werewolves being the worst deck? I think that was not great. I think that uh, it, is an uh, is kind of a miss like it, there's going to be a worse deck in every you know every format you know we had lore hold right uh we have in some cases like green white so you know sometimes doesn't come through having it be red green in midnight hunt and enough worse than the other archetypes that it's like dramatic mm-hmm. is just such a beat it really felt like when you drafted red green you were playing corset and everyone else was playing an expert level set yeah like it did. all their cards did cool stuff and all your cards were garbage that's right it, especially just put the little cherry on top that like silver bolt and Olivia's midnight <laughs> ambush are just like, Oh, by the way, there's also unconditional removal when you do manage to flip your werewolf. Thank you very much. So right. even defenestrate yeah. killed all of them. It just came out <laughs> all those things together made it. So it was like kicking the dog, you know, you, uh, you, even more. So not, not good. That's right. Really, really tough. Uh, there. Okay. Uh, what do we got next? Uh, <laughs> this is a tough year uh, for this one. This is the Lemmy for the bet, the, the bet that wins the best man award. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's really rough because <clears throat> usually you'll find at least a few decent examples of enter the battlefield bounce a thing. There are a couple, but I'm going to go a little off script here and give it to Frost Trickster, which technically doesn't ETB and bounce something, but it's very man of war like other, otherwise. And it certainly was the best of this. It gives you the same feeling, right? that you can, you know, nullify a threat, at least temporarily. And in some cases, Frost Trickster is better, right? Because it actually will keep a creature off the board for two turns or, or keep it from being relevant for two turns where Man of War, they can simply replay the creature. Sometimes that's actually okay for them if they're going to stabilize or, or do something like that. So best Man Award, Frost Trickster. Congratulations, Definitely. Frost Trickster. Um, this is a new Lemmy. The best new mechanic or card type that was added this year, you know, it, it could it could be a mechanic straight up if if we liked mechanics, or it could be a type of card or something that we'd want to see going forward. And there were two that jumped out to me. Um, the first one was the Scry land, the Scry Dual Lands at Common from Strixhaven. They ETB tap, they tap for two colors, and you can pay four, tap them to Scry one. And I'll tell you, I would not hate seeing these type of cards just in every set or very often. Um, this to me was a really, really elegant way to deal with late game mana flood. And we've seen multiple ways to do that over the years. And this was just another way to add to it, but they made it expensive enough that you're paying, you know, effectively five mana to scry to try to make sure that you hit some action. So it's not like it's just amazingly powerful and you just sort of run away with the game. You're paying a real cost to do this. But I'll tell you what, you got seven lands on the battlefield and you draw another land or an insignificant spell and you're like, go. You're really happy that you can spend your turn scrying and try to find some action at that point in the game when that's actually relevant. And then up until then, it's just mana fixing and mana smoothing, which I think that limited could use a bit more of anyway. I don't want to make that free, but I like having a bit more mana fixing than a bit less in most formats. So where do you come down on these scry duels? Would you like to see more of them? I think the scry duels are excellent. I would not mind seeing a cycle like this uh, again. I'm a really big fan of scry duels, uh, the double faced lands. Like just like the the modest face rate lands, spells that's a good one. That's that a good were one. on tap lands in Zendikar Rising were really cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. So that's really cool too. Um, the other one, Luis, that came to Zendikar mind Rising was, was over a year ago, but you know, it, you, you it get the was. point. Yeah, um, but but those are the types of things. The other one that came to mind is much more recent, and it's Blood Tokens. Oh, I really like Blood Tokens too. Blood 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 plays out really well. It's one of the actual high points of the format. I think that. Blood is like a little bit more of an evocative token that I don't know that it could fit into every uh, yeah. set or, or as clues kind of can. But could, I still could we would love rename to see it? it? Yeah. I'm or would that be, would it be inelegant? 
uh, to do that, to have the exact same card, but instead of having it be a blood token, what we just call it like a charge token or a, you know, whatever, just some magical word token that's more generic. Yeah, I, I mean, it would kind of what, what I would here's here's what I would do if I were if I were kind of like running the things and deciding this is the next set where we think blood would fit. I would look to see if it makes flavor sense as blood because there's some sets where it could. It doesn't always have to be strictly vampires. And if it doesn't, then consider renaming and making another one that's just that. And if it does make sense to and, – and hopefully one of those two things work or make a very similar mechanic. But I think blood actually worked out really nicely. Yeah. Would you – how would you – like if you – again, I want to put you back in that driver's seat again of, of you making the decisions for these. So one simplistic way would be to say instead of calling them blood tokens, we'll call them charge tokens or whatever and put them in every set. Every set gets these, they're tacked onto a whole bunch of commons and limited flourishes as a result. That's a little ham handed though, right? Because there's, we've, as we've just discussed, there's multiple ways to handle this situation. This sort of like, Hey, let, let's help mitigate flood a little bit or help people make more decisions in the game that can get them back into it or keep them relevant in it or whatever. So would you just always check the box of we have covered that angle? And sometimes it's these type of, you know, blood or charge tokens or whatever, but other times it's scry lands or other times it's duels or, you know, or the, um, scrying, like literally just scry, you know, all of these different ways that we've had to do this. Would you just sort of check the box on each one and it rotates through how they actually do it? Or would you try to pick one like people have been calling to make a uh, scry or cycling, more importantly, cycling evergreen for quite a while as well and have it in every set i, I think it's better to rotate and not just have the same thing it's, it's novel experiences are really good okay um so i i think that uh you wouldn't want to use the same one over and over again but i would like to see blood get into the rotation okay yeah i would too i i don't know if there's more uh i don't know how you put it design cost with a card that produces tokens Versus like if you put cycling on cards where you don't need to have tokens, I, is that something that people – like is that a problem or – No, I don't think that's like a too too relevant of a metric. Like – Okay. It even actually opens the door for like – imagine you you had a set that had like five ways to make blood tokens. Mm -hmm. Well, now if you put a red creature that sacrifices an artifact to get plus two plus oh, it actually has like a little bit of extra synergy going on, which is kind of oh, cool. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I assume that just like logistically speaking, it's okay too because like if you print a token, you can only print so many of different types of tokens for a set. So it's probably taking a spot or so. I don't know. It probably doesn't matter. Anyway, I hope that we do see blood tokens specifically or, you know, a version of blood tokens going into into the future as well. They're really, really good for late game while not being overtly powerful, right? Like the, the, we're not talking about like clue tokens that draw you cards and can, can be your entire game plan. That's not what blood tokens are, but boy, smoothing out the cool build decisions like you found early on, hey, I want to make my deck curve out to five and then all my blood tokens just, you know, cycle away lands after that. And that's really neat, like to to be able to, to, you know, leverage uh, tokens like that. Okay. Let's give away our last few awards here. Um, I want to do it for each of the card uh, types or rarities. So common, uncommon, and then a rare mythic rare of the year. Um, common of the year is actually our easiest category. It's not remotely close. Always be hoarding organ hoarder wins common of the year. Let me. Oh yeah, Organ Hoarder is just taking it, taking it home with no contest. It's the Mythic Common, which is not a, not something that we ever had before. That's right, and it's and it really lived up. Um, this is a big win for you. You were all over this like day one. You started like we loved the card. Like when we when we did the set review, we're just like wow, you know, like yes, yeah, because we can re read the card because we, we read it. But it it was not clear to me how much how amazing this card was until we started actually playing with it like even us giving it a relatively high grade it it is it, in the format that it was in it was absolutely incredible it'd be really good in any format i think but in that format it was just absolute perfection but you were hammering it i mean like you said you took it over the 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 
the one GG rare, which was also amazing, by the way, that card performed super well in the format, but it was like every, like, it just became a meme between you and I on Twitter because people would say, what should I take out of this pack? And it was just like hoarder. Well, there's a sweet rare. Yeah, just take Organ Hoarder. Well, what about the, No, just take Organ Hoarder. It puts you in the color you wanted. It synergized with all of the things. It was card advantage. It was board presence. And Organ Hoarder wins the Lemmy for Common of the Year. What about Uncommon of the Year? There's a there's a bunch. Um, uh, Skullport Merchant. Card was really good. Battle Cry Goblin, BCG. That one was good. One of my favorites was Bookworm, the bookie monster. Um, I know Igneous Inspiration did really well in its format. Agar was sweet. You you were on Agar early. Svela. Svela. I don't know like what the actual win rate one is, whereas like Organ Hoarder was pretty easy. It, it is just like, you know, and, and by every metric it was great. I think for me, Svela is like one of my favorites. Svela. Svela was just so fun. Svela. Battle Cry Goblin was one of the ones that – overperformed by the largest degree. Like it looked good. Then you play it and you're like, this is like a five, five haste. <laughs> yeah, <two> exactly. <laughs> I remember playing it and being like, Oh my God. And like, it, it, it's one of those cards that like, if you have the ability to, to play it, you're like, I'll probably win. Right. Like I'm not going to do all the math, but like this has to be enough. <laughs> and then you play it and you're like, yep, I won. But uh, so to me, it is between Svela and Battlecry Goblin, and I'm going Svela with you. I, I think Svela was the sweetest. And uh, when you could get it going, it was like just slow enough, but just value enough. And it had the, the nice defensive stats and all that stuff. So Svela Ice Shaper, best uncommon of the year. You good with yeah, that? I like it. Okay. What about our rare or mythic rare of the year? There's so many that overperformed. I, I did some searches on 17 lands to kind of see what the most powerful ones were. Um, but this is a combination, not just of like what had the best win rate, but also, you know, things like what stood out, what had a, an impact on us, that type of thing. Some of the ones that were the highest were Nadar, Selfless Paladin, Brutal Cathar, Adeline, uh, Wedding Announcement, by the way, three mana white rares, anybody? Um, Hannah and Alina, Dreadfeast Demon, Goldspan Dragon, Asika's Chariot, Coma. So I think at the end of the day, all these cards are obviously great. You just have to give so much credit to the wedding announcement or Hana and Alina or Sika's chariots of the world because they cost three or four mana. Yeah. Like sometimes you you have Dreadfeast Demon in your opening hand and you never get to cast it or right. or you cast it when you're already on the ropes. And that's a particularly good one at kind of getting to stabilize. But even then it might be too late. You know, Goldspan Dragon even more so. Yes, it's cheaper, but sometimes it's like, oh, I can't afford to attack with Goldspan Dragon. Now this card looks a lot worse. Whereas like a three mana card or a four mana card, it just it just completely goes over the top if you play it on curve. And then even when you play it late, it's not like these cards are weak. Yeah, because the card that stands out the most to me is Coma, right? As like it suffers from exactly what you said, even worse, right? It being two double colors and all that stuff, but. It was the most like unbeatably frustrating card, right? When when they played it, um, it because it was not surrounded by a whole bunch of other amazing rares. There were other good rares, but like it really was head and shoulders as far as like I don't know <laughs> card we got tweeted at us the most about like this card's BS. <laughs> you know, was probably coma. Um, what do you want to give it to? We got to pick one. I yeah, I guess if I had to pick one of these overall, it might be a Sika's Chariot. But okay, I I don't know. All these are very very good. It's no, there's no clear winner. You know, they can be yeah. co champions. They can all share the podium. No, that's not how award ceremonies work <laughs> at all. No, that's not how that's not how it goes. <laughs> no, no, there can only be one Lemmy. And uh, yeah, we'll give it to Sika's Chariot, the Cadillac, and uh, and and definitely one of the best. Really great year. Uh, Luis for, for limited, you know, we've had another, you know, again, it wasn't, you know, perfect across the board, but wizards really is in a stride with delivering solid to great limited formats kind of over and over and over again. And even though, yeah, AFR wasn't the best, it was lopsided as far as, um, colors went and it was, uh, uh, and, and some of the mechanics, some of the key mechanics kind of missed, but really, every I mean, Strixhaven I loved. Kaldheim was fantastic. I mean, really, 
people, I don't know if you remember, but people were talking about call time being like one of the goat formats. You know, that seemed, that conversation seems to have died down a bit, but you know, this is like really, really high praise for this stuff. And, uh, you know, the last couple of sets have been really strong as well. So overall, it's been a really good year for limited. Yeah, totally agree. I think limited has been, been awesome. I, I, I do want to slip one last Lemmy in here, mm. which is the, the most valuable website of the year. Okay. Goldbelly.com. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, as of uh, tomorrow, I'll certainly be green, agreeing with you uh, on that one. Uh, Luis had me sent um, barbecue from Kansas City, <laughs> and I got it yesterday. And uh, I talked to my mom, and I'm, I'm heading up there tomorrow for Christmas Eve. And she was like, well, you know, she's doing – she's having family over somebody for, for Christmas Day. And she's like, well, what should we do for food on Christmas Eve? She's like, I was thinking – she literally said, like, I was thinking about just ordering Chinese food. And that's kind of a family tradition. Like, we, we all love Chinese food and stuff. But, I mean – not exactly, you know, <laughs> what you'd think of when you're like, hey, you know, the family holiday or whatever, let's order out, you know. And I said, Mom, I got you. <laughs> I said, what I need from you is I need some rolls, rolls or bread and uh, and and maybe some like coleslaw or potato salad or something. And I'm going to bring up the rest. And I told her about it. And she's like, oh, this is great. And so I get to show up. And the way it comes is um, it's packaged up like they cook it and then they seal it up in bags. And then the most common way to reheat it is to put it in like uh, boiling water for a little while. And it kind of heats up everything. And then you take it out and serve it. And that's it. So I'm super stoked. And I'm telling you, Luis, my stepdad is... <laughs> He's going to be like, yes, like he loves barbecue. There's no chance he's ever had. Um, what is, is it called? Joe's Casey Joe's? Oklahoma Joe's Oklahoma Joe's. Yeah. Which is in Kansas city. But anyway, Oklahoma Joe's, um, and, uh, he's never had it before. So he's going to be, I mean, he has a smoker at home, like he's into this stuff. So he's going to be really soaked and he doesn't know yet either. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. So oh, yeah. thanks for that, man. Really yeah, cool. Yeah. So I sent, uh, I sent Chi on the, I know because he he's he's not going to listen to the show, so it's, so it won't ruin the surprise. It gets there in about a week because uh -huh. he was out of town. Uh, the pork shoulder, the pork roast from Momofuku, the the bo -sam, uh, so Oh, awesome! It yeah. comes with like the pork roast and the glaze and some like buns and some kimchi and and stuff like that. So oh, he's gonna love that. Thanks, Anyways, man. I, that was really I, nice of you. Oh yeah, no, I, I've loved gold. Gold belly has been really <laughs> something. A good way to make up for the fact that we can't really go out or haven't gone out much this year. That's right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one tomorrow. Um, one last thing before we go, Luis. Uh, we did mention briefly that the um, Vintage Cube is back up on Magic Online. So for Cube aficionados, we're officially in uh, Holiday Cube time. And this is, you know, this is something that I look forward to every year. Like just having the Vintage Cube up and uh, firing off some drafts while it's time to kind of relax and kick back a little bit. Um, I just wanted to do like a real quick kind of update slash primer on it from, from your perspective. Cause I know that you drafted the last version. I don't think that they changed it too much since then. Um, anything that comes to mind that people who maybe are a little out of the loop on the vintage cube, maybe they've drafted it before, but haven't come back or whatever is storm still a thing. Um, what are some of the archetypes that, that stand out to you or maybe even some cards that, uh, that people shouldn't be sleeping on? Mostly. I think that the, the same things hold true as before, which is you want to take cheap cards. Mono red and mono white are two of the best decks. Uh, you know, if you if if what you're looking for is to rack up the dubs, mono red and mono white are actually great ways to do that. Mono white in particular was the white most winning cube arch archetype insane. every cube. Mm -hmm. um, lands are really important. The original dual lands like you know volcanic island, and then the fetch lands, Pluto Delta, really high premium on those. And of course, the power is all great. And uh, in general, I just like taking cheap, flexible cards like Remand or Preordain and, you know, and just kind of going from there and seeing what develops. You, you know, though, obviously part of the fun of Cube is sometimes you just feel like forcing the plow under strip mine deck or whatever, Reanimator. But overall, it's pretty wide open. And uh, if you take efficient cards, you'll, you'll, you'll end up doing pretty well. Uh, is Storm still a thing? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Storm's good. I mean, it's not great, but you, you won't win with Storm, but it's a lot of fun. Like, And if yeah. you get a really good Storm deck, it can do wild things. Overall, it's not a winning archetype, though. Okay. A couple of cards that I wanted to highlight <clears throat> just that are, are newer, or maybe not newer, but that people still um, sleep on. Palace Jailer. 
card's no, awesome. Palace busted. Yeah. Palace Jailer is, is just a busted magic card. It routinely goes 10th pick and it's just such a good card. Yeah. So don't, don't sleep on that one. And then the other one is, I actually can't remember the name, but it's the new reanimator guy. You know, the, the one that comes, comes in and dings him for three. They have to discard, sack stuff. You draw cards. And then whenever it attacks, it does that too. I can't remember what that card's called. It's like eight mana. You know, six black black demon or Arcana whatever. Arcana Cruelty is the best reanimation slash sneak attack target. It's actually better than Gristlebrand. For- yeah, which is like wow, right? Oh, I mean, a- I- another card is Lalia, the Blade Reforged. I actually have been playing this one in Vintage, so I know it's good. Two and a red, two two haste. When it attacks, exile the top card of your deck. You can play it this turn, and it gets plus one plus one counter every time you exile a card from your deck or graveyard. Yeah, that card it hits really hard, gets you a uh, value, and. It grows very, very quickly in the cube as well. So keep an eye out for those cards. But otherwise, jump in, send us your best cube decks, and uh, and let us know what you did. We're going to call it a show there. Thanks for hanging out with us for the uh, the 2021 Limmy Awards. And uh, we hope to see you out in the vintage cube streets when uh, once uh, – well, once we're done recording the show, in, in some people's cases, I'm sure. Um, If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV pretty much everywhere. You can find um, everything related to the show over at LRcast.com. Again, on Twitter is when we'll announce when the uh, the FTX charity cube draft tournament is going to go. As as Luis mentioned, me, Luis, uh, BK, and uh, and Kenji, Numatanami, are all going to be uh, battling against some F- some prominent, I will say, FTXers, and uh, we're going to see who can take home the most for their uh, charity of choice. We'll we'll tweet that out. Also, make sure you check out FTX.com outside the U.S. and FTX.us inside. Safe, regulated way to manage your digital assets. If you're interested in checking it out, make sure you go to those it, whichever applicable website, or you can download the app as well. Get yourself some information about it and uh, see what's going on in this exciting new world of blockchain technology. I will remind you once again that any type of investment is something that you that carries risk and you should always consult an investment professional before doing so. Make sure you check out Channel Fireball if you want to burn any holiday money or getting the last minute presents over at CFB. Channelfireball.com is the place to go. Make sure you use the affiliate code LR at checkout. With that, we'll be back next week, but everybody have a good holiday in between. We'll see you then. So our discussion earlier actually made me change my plans because I was thinking about the two times that I remember people actually breaking draft formats, two pretty prominent times. Mm. Uh, one is the spider spawning thing, which mm-hmm. I'm sure most people are pretty well acquainted. It's pretty famous at this point. And what that was is in original Innistrad, it turned out, and this wasn't apparent in the beginning, and I'm really curious how that would work out these days given how many more people play. Mm-hmm. I think it would have been discovered much sooner, but back then people didn't realize initially that playing spider spawning um, and self mill, like the blue self mill cards and uh, just, you know, get, getting to, to, to basically mill your whole deck and flashback spider spawning and then loop it with memories journey was actually a really good strategy. And you could even play these like wild decks and, for a while, the people in the know for a little bit of time were just like jamming that, and it was really good. Yeah, and and that's you like would a actually deck example. yourself. You you were trying to get all your cards done, and then there was a three card combo with Memories Journey, which would shuffle a card back in, and then I forgot what it's called, but it's Runic two and a blue. Yeah, Rune of Repetition, which would take a card from Exile and put it into your hand, and then you could cast it again, put it back on, and then do this loop over and over again because Journey lets you get multiple cards. It was really, really sweet, and you would just spit out as many one to reach spiders as you had creatures in your deck or, you know, as creatures in your graveyard. And then there was even not of the bone, which would help you get to that point, which is two in a green and you gain two life for each creature in your graveyard. So that would give you this huge life buffer to give you the time to actually do this stuff. It was, it was, it's the most impactful, memorable deck of any limited archetype I've ever encountered. So the second example, this actually kind of translated into more of an impact in terms of the people who had it got to top eight, a Grand Prix with it. This was in Champions of Kamigawa where it turned out Dampen Thought was a deck. So Dampen Thought is a card for one and a blue. It mills target player for four. 
but it has splice onto arcane, which means for one and a blue, if you cast an arcane spell, you can pay two mana to like have this ride along and have its effect, but it stays in your hand. Mm. And that was a whole mechanic and splice on the arcane was kind of a weird one, very parasitic, not one we're probably going to see again, whatever. Mm -hmm. But weeks into the format, no one knew that dampened thought was actually just an insane deck that you could draft where you're like playing all these blue arcane cantrips and bad spells cards. All it was. The funny thing is it was mostly cards that were considered bad. Oh. But if you jammed your deck full of arcane spells and had like two dampen thoughts, you could mill the opponent out really quickly. And a bunch of the arcane spells were like bounce target creature or tap target permanent. So you're like psychic puppetry, tap your permanent, mill you for four. Consuming vortex, bounce your big creature, mill you for four. Then dampen thought, splice dampen thought, mill you for eight, cast my last dampen thought, bam, you're dead. Wow. And that was such a fun deck and it was completely unknown. And I remember uh, I wasn't even at this tournament at this point. I remember following coverage. This team had broken it and they all just forced it. And like, I think at least one of them made top eight and it was just like the story of the tournament. And that just like never happens in limited, right? It's, it was just such a cool effect. That won't happen again, right? I don't think so because there's never going to be a meaningful limited tournament. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It won't happen also because there's now, (laughs) you know, 100x people playing and all these people streaming and stuff. It's just going to like, like you think Death Sea wouldn't find this deck in the first two days. Like, you know, he's drafted every archetype twice, three days in. So now all of a sudden he has to find the weird stuff. But yes, I I don't think that this is going to happen again. It was fun when it happened. And uh, wow, damn, that was a lot of fun. Now I wish I could go draft it. 